Hey, thanks for jumping in, and you're probably wondering how the hell I came up with this title. Well, we're going to get into that here in a few minutes, but but first, like normal, I got a handful of things I want to let you know about. First and foremost, Liv Reese. These guys make high-quality CBD product, and it's very easy for me to tell you all about it because I use it all the time. Jump over to their website, livereshi.com, use the code word TABLE50, and you're looking at half off. Yep, 50% off everything you buy, and that's uh, applied at checkout. This stuff is grown and put together all organically and third-party tested right in Arizona, shipped all over the world. Check them out, livereshi.com. Support them who support us. Also, my website, waltzkitchentable.com, you want to know about Everything I'm doing at the show, got some cool things coming up, Uh, things that I would like to point out. I've been blogging a little bit, check that out. And also, I added a page on the website where you can uh, see all the shows, podcasts that I've been on as a guest. Been having just a lot of fun talking to people from all over the world as a guest on their show. So support them as well. All right, man, let's get to this. Welcome to Walt's Kitchen Table, where I feature captivating stories from fascinating people. Michael is far from fascinating, and uh, he'll like that I said that. No, um, I've had the privilege to know Michael. We met when a mutual friend started a business, and we got working together in the video and photo business. And we had a lot of fun, got super mad at each other a lot because I was the salesperson, and he was the editor. And my favorite uh, quote is, we'll fix that in post, right, Michael? But um, on a personal, you know, on his side, he's very talented actor, filmmaker, and um, does great editing as well. But uh, the story on where we got the title, you know what? I'm just going to let him tell you all about it. Let's get to it. And we are off, dude. So my disclaimer is everything you say now is going to be on the internet. Crap. All right. So it's over, dude. All right, bud. Nice talking to you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> People are used to seeing this face, though. So oh, only ooh. fans, you porn. I mean, yeah, it's all over. So I don't think dude, it's going to be shocked. Dude, it would not shock me a fucking bit if you had an OnlyFans account. (laughs) (laughs) It'd be something really weird, like, watch this guy throw pudding at his chest or something. (laughs) Dude, that, uh, you know about how many, how many, uh, views you would get? Three. No, dude, there'd be some people out there that would just all be all over that. There'd be a lot of views for the first one, and they're like, what the fuck is this? And then they'd see it, and they'd be like, oh, he is not attractive. Let's move on from there. Look at that chest. That's horrible. No, dude, I bet you you could make a decent (laughs) living with throwing pudding on your chest on an OnlyFans account. You probably could. Everything is out there. That's what I'm saying, dude. I mean, there's got to be somebody male, female, or the 72 other genders that are out there that will sit in their recliner and watch you throw pudding on your chest and give you three bucks for it. Because isn't it like my friends tell me it's like three bucks? (laughs) Is it a subscription or do I charge my own thing? Like say, hey, mine is $10 or is it all a a base price? I think it's uh, there's like a base like a monthly subscription of three bucks, five bucks. I mean, it's, I don't know what the dollar amount. Yeah. The the uh, platform that I'm thinking about is Patreon, yeah. where it's like you get you this much for this and stuff. Yeah, and then you can quote unquote make a donation. Mm. Look mm. at us old people talking about things we don't know. I know it. Isn't it fun? Like, though? Oh, these new little things with uh, on the internet. <laughs> The intranet, the interweb, interweb. There you go. That's when you really know somebody's not has any clue what they're talking about. What's this intraweb? I need to order something. What the? What are you going to order? A Model T? Do I do that through my email? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Man, where are you? Are you still down in South Carolina? North Carolina. Yep, North Carolina. I'm in the Raleigh uh, Triangle area. You like it down there? It's all right. It's um. I mean, I do. It's uh. I, I heard someone once call it um like a Goldilocks state that you know it's not 
great. It's not bad. It's just nice in the middle. You know, it's not everything's fine. Oh, okay. so yeah, I, I enjoyed it enough. It's it's a good place overall. It's not like being in New Jersey or New York, huh? I mean, they. I mean, not Jersey, but you know, New York. I mean, it. it, it I like I like New York. Uh, it's a little little dirty for for my germophobia, but uh, overall, it's a cool Oof. place. So, <laughs> so I got a I got a story for you that happened to me today at work. Uh, okay. Is most people know listening, and if you don't, I work for U-Haul. I'm an area field manager, and I get trucks stolen all the time. I'm in the Jersey. I'm in the Metro. Is it Metro? Would that be considered Metro? But Newark and Jersey City area, right? Heavy yeah. populated. So what they do is they rent trucks and they don't bring them back. It's just part of the business. Wow. So, so we're just over the the river from New York City. So I get a call from somebody over in the New York City office, and they're like, "Hey, we found your van." I'm like, "Sweet." Uh, I says, "Is it is it in good shape?" And they're like, "Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it." I said, "Okay, just you know, tow it back to the dealership." He's like, "Cool, no problem." On it. All right, cool. Like two hours later, I get the I get a call from the same dude. I recognize the phone number. I'm like, hey man, what's up? He goes, We can't make this shit up, dude. I was like, oh, fuck. What go. happened? <laughs> yeah, I go, what happened now? And Mike, th Michael, the reason I bring this up with you is because you and I worked together for a long time. And some of the best people that I've met before during and after being creative and shit there's no way they could come up with the shit that i see <laughs> every day it's it's unbelievable dude so he goes they towed the van to the police precinct and dropped it in the lieutenant parking spot in front of the precinct i'm like okay he goes and it was stolen from there <laughs> I go, it was stolen from in front of the police department. He goes, yeah, in the lieutenant parking spot. In the big spot, yeah. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh. I go, all right, did they get him? He goes, yeah, like six blocks later, because, you know, as soon as they got out of there, they chased him, and like six blocks later, they got him. But now I can't have my van back because it was uh, involved in a crime. Wow. And I know when I go for my Grand Theft Auto, it's in – the staff parking area of a police I think department. That would be, I think that would be a little more on the down low, right? In the, yeah. The you know, do you want to be. Yeah, and not not far in the back corner because, you know, that's when people park their nice cars <laughs> so they don't get scratched. So you want to get the car that's a little closer, you know, non conspicuous. But, yeah, I was just like, fuck. And he goes, why do you think that happened? And I said, well, they actually had – they probably had something in the van – when that got towed so they needed to get it out so they figured the best thing to do was steal the van from the police department <laughs> and get whatever they had in there whatever packaging you know they use it to transport all sorts of fucking crap but yeah wow. yeah that was today's story dude that was i was like oh geez every day every dull people, moment yeah people get desperate man uh i was talking to a lady in a corporate office down in in uh arizona and we were talking about theft and damage and people doing all sorts of crazy things you know and she goes i never think about that and i go yeah because you've never been desperate yeah and she's like what and i go did you ever worry about where your next meal's coming from she's like no i go do you ever worry about that your baby doesn't have formula she's like no i go then you don't get thinking like that Cause you just go and buy it. Now I'm just, if you ain't got no food or I'm sorry, you don't have any money or any prospects to like a paycheck coming in. You start to think of some crazy shit to keep that baby from crying. You yeah. know, I mean that U-Haul could be the back of the U-Haul could be where you're sleeping that night. So yeah, hundred percent. I see that dude. That's common. I see yeah, that all, really? all, all the time. Wow. So I've told this story and I, and again, it, it's, I've, I've told it before, but you're going to love it. And there's some people that haven't heard it. And I, it's one of the best. <laughs> so in Newark, I got this guy, he's a dealer and super nice guy, really nice guy. And I got a 10 foot truck and I see on the schedule and it's going to Chicago, right? No problem. So he goes, he calls me up and same thing. He goes, I, I can't make this up. Well, he goes, if I didn't see this in person, 
I wouldn't believe it. And I said, and his name's Alex. I go, well, all right, Alex, what's up, man? He goes, so a, a Uber pulls up and this lady gets out dressed to the nines. Like he goes, she was beautifully dressed, had a rolling luggage that probably cost $1,200. And she goes, is that my truck? And he goes, yeah. She goes, do you mind if we put this suitcase in the back while we do the paperwork? He's like, no, oh, no problem, no problem. He goes, Walt, as soon as I saw the back of the truck, because I knew it, the back door is open just a little bit. It wasn't latched. He goes, I he goes, I said, ah, I'm just going to pull the Band-Aid off. Yeah. Whip, whip the door open, and there's two there's two female homeless people having sex. Really? One was completely naked. One was half naked. And, of course, jokingly, I'm like, what half? But he... Uh, he goes, I kicked them all out, and he goes, I looked at the lady, and he goes, this is what surprised me the most. And there was needles and drug paraphernalia and all that, okay. and all their clothes and shit, right? He goes, I looked at the lady, and she didn't even miss a beat, was on her phone, and goes, you know, texting on her phone, wasn't like talking on the phone. She looked in the back of the truck, looked at me, and goes, clean this shit up. I got to get going. I was like, what? He goes, yep. <laughs> You know, so I pulled the truck around, you know, kicked him out, pulled the trucks. He's got a facility. He cleaned it all up. She got in, psh, drove away, never even said a word. And I go, there's going to be a complaint. Nope. Lady never complained. I'm like, I wonder what was in that suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> so she probably flew in with a empty suitcase, made a stop, filled up the suitcase, and then was hauling back to Chicago. I mean, he is like, well, she was in big high heels and a, like a, a suit, but a dress, you know, like a, yeah, not a pants suit, but you know, she had a skirt and yeah. I was like, I don't know, bro. So I see, I see crazy shit like that and just stealing Cadillac converters and mirrors and tires. And yeah, yeah I thought it was going to go a different way that someone was in that suitcase all like bundled up and she's like, you mind if we stick that in there while we do paperwork and then they yeah. unzip themselves while they're in doing paperwork. And Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's probably in the Southerner States, you know, when you got to get across the border, but yeah, imagine that he throws a suit. She, he picks it up, throws a suitcase in the back and you hear a, Ooh, could you be like, huh? What was that? She's like, just never mind. Close the door. I'd be yeah. like, the oh, fuck. Like I got toys for my grandchildren. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they make they make noise, right? Uh, what are you doing nowadays, bud? Uh, still just uh, editing, acting, doing film stuff when I can. So it's just kind of a, a hodgepodge, depending as things go. I mean, the full time job is editing, but um, uh, you know, with acting and films and all that, it's as so. as things come about, come up as I, I get you know casting things and all that. So what yeah, the, just a mix. Now, what are you working full time editing for, like a company? Yeah. Yeah. I started oh, last nice. year with a, a local production company here called Storyboard Media. So um, I'm their full-time editor and working with uh, into uh, post-production supervision for them and stuff too, uh, like with Generic Brand Human, how it was there. What, uh, what kind of stuff do they do? Same kind of thing? Commercials and little videos business videos no, they do like they do a lot more with uh like business to business b2b marketing and things like that um and so uh like we did just did one with lowe's lowe's foods and um a lot of theirs is really cool because they instead of just finding somebody who wants a video and editing it for them they have a whole kind of marketing plan and roadmap that they start from the very beginning all with the pre-production process and uh, working with them through that my aspect is still with post-production um, but the company itself starts all through the beginning um, and works with them every step of the way to really find what they want and everything and they do a lot of humor and and stuff with their videos so it kind of gives it a an interesting edge over what you typically see especially with like corporate videos and things yeah, like that yeah. I mean, that's what we were trying to do. Just they're doing it at a bigger scale, right? Yeah. Just yeah, with more, more employees. Well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. How'd you get hooked up with those guys? Is that what you went down for? No, you've been down there longer than that. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, um, this, uh, after generic brand human moved on, um, uh, and I was just doing freelance stuff and, and acting and everything. And then, um, I saw that they were looking for editors and all of that. So tried out with them and and uh it worked out yeah so what now 
is that like is there like a Craig uh, probably a more updated version of Craigslist to find gigs? You probably got all sorts of forums and all that kind of shit, right? There are. I mean, I'm, this was through LinkedIn. I think that's still a, a good way when you're looking for uh, certain companies and things like that. I don't know that I would go. Maybe Craigslist has changed, but in the past, you know, that was kind of a tough way to, you know, go about things and find. I mean, we I know we used it to find freelancers at times, but, um, you know, being the freelancer and trying to go through that, that's you never know how things are going to go or oh, I see what you mean. like and all of that. So, uh, you know, LinkedIn is a pretty safe bet with it for, for a lot and, you know, research them and they did a lot of good work. And the, the, the big thing with them too is personalities. Everybody there is awesome and has fun personalities and, and you can joke <clears throat> around and things like that, which is, which is super important. Yeah. That's a, that's one thing. Now, are you, that's one thing about my gig, uh, it's blue collar and the humor is it's it, you got to be pretty thick skin, man. There's even times I'm like, okay, I got this. and that's me, bud. That's <laughs> tough. Yeah. They got to really go yeah. too far for that. Oh, so, so speaking of that, um, you know, we were working from home for a while, right? When all this craziness happened, I never worked from home. Cause I, I mean, how do I work from home when I'm working on trucks and stuff? Right. So yeah. I was always gone. And Val, my wife, was working at home. Well, I would get home pretty early, right? Because, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but, the, you know, I would get home early. So I'm on one side of the apartment, and I'm talking to one of my dealers, and he's having a hard time with a customer. And Val is on a call, and she can, you know, she can hear me, and I talk pretty loud. And I got all excited. And the dealer was like, this guy's being a jerk and he's doing this and he's doing this. And I go, dude, you know what? You could tell him to go suck a dick. And everybody, and oh, I'm sorry. My wife corrected me. I said, he could go suck a bag of dicks. And <laughs> people on my wife's call heard that and they're like, what? What? what was that? And she goes, oh, that's my husband talking to his customers. And they're like, what? what? He talks to his customers that way. They're probably all like, "Oh, Walt, yeah, yeah, yeah." That it's Walt. Sense. That's what that I'm saying. Up, yeah, yeah. It's, it's Walt. That makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, he, Walt said that. Okay, whatever. But uh, do you work remotely? Um, a bit. So there's two days a week that um, I can work at home remotely. Like if there's editing and things like that, because I also shoot. Like they have a uh, a podcast that they do, so I'm filming that and everything. But um, yeah, it's, oh, nice. It's it's a, it's a mix. What's their show about? What's their podcast about? Um, I mean, it all kind of centers around business to business um, and with them kind of talking about things they've learned, talking about how things are in the B2B marketing landscape, talking about like one of them would be using humor in B2B videos and kind of yeah. talking about the importance of that so that people, one, can kind of expand on the the types of videos they're making and then two, hopefully, you know, come to us and get those videos made and everything. Right, but right. Uh, yeah, it's a whole gamut dealing with basically uh, B2B and then the kind of marketing trends and everything that, that happened in this landscape. Oh, that's kind of fun. There's just so much. I'm on a couple uh, sites that, you know, for to explore, to have guests come on and then me to be a guest, right? And that the entrepreneur category and the business category is so thick dude oh my god there's yeah. so many of those podcasts out there Whew. I mean, yeah and it's hard because you don't know i mean you can research them and see who's doing what and if they right. kind of know their shit or not um so the, the nice thing about these guys the it's called the video reformation um and they're they're really funny and personable as well so even if you don't know a lot about what they're talking about and you're learning about it and stuff they make it kind of fun and they'll joke together and stuff yeah. and so that makes a big difference too it's not really very dry even though it might feel like dry material to some um the way they present it and teach and talk about it and all that kind of gives it that extra edge that that helps a lot but i think uh humor you can educate with humor quite a bit yeah you know it lands you know and takes the edge off you know you know, how many people, including myself, deflect when you're uncomfortable with humor, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you shoot too, you still, you shoot with these guys? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, I, I, it's a three camera setup for the podcast. So I film that and then, um, 
occasionally depending on on what's happening with different clients and stuff like i got to direct a piece of the lowe's foods uh spot i got to do camera uh camera work and and second camera on a different spot that they did for a, a organization so yeah it gives me a chance to do a little bit more than than just the editing That's as okay. well which is nice yeah yeah i know you always enjoyed being behind the camera yeah you guys, you guys travel much or um, not a whole lot. So especially with COVID and all of that, um, you know, that kind of slowed things down and especially in the, the corporate world events and things like that, that you would normally travel for. But um, there, there is some like uh, last month or so they uh, out in Phoenix, there was a shoot sometimes in South Carolina or traveling around. So there is you know, occasionally things that come up, but it all kind of depends too on how the, the event landscape goes over time, which, probably is is close to dead in a lot of ways because of this and yeah, things going yeah. virtual and all that, that they're just not going to start, you know, bringing 400 people out to a conference center to, to do those things anymore. So it, it does uh, change up. I think, I think it'll come back eventually because just human nature, we need to be around people and you get zoomed out a little bit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just, but everybody is so paranoid, you know, and then, and all that but yeah we won't get into that because yeah there's there's enough other uh platforms you can listen to and hear people talk about that shit but yeah you uh, can open your front door and seven people are talking about it i mean oh my god dude holy cow yeah it's, yeah and it's uh bad. what uh and then you got some personal projects going on right um not so much right now i mean def okay. definitely acting and and freelance things here and there come up but uh uh after my uh my last film wrapped and was released and everything that was the most things so that's just going through with streaming distribution and all that now was that your film or were you just an well not, not just an actor in it but did you have production parts in that as well yeah, that was one that I wrote and directed. Uh, that was the um, where we're meant to be. It's a feature oh, film. Right. I remember so, that. Yeah, yeah, so that one's uh, streaming. Ash was an associate producer on it. Um, oh, nice. And uh, yeah, so that one's out there now. And then um, is it yeah, getting it just any more things come up? Is it getting any traction? It is. I, I mean, it did more at the beginning because it's it's been a few years now. Uh, it did a year of festival runs and and we were pretty successful with that and everything. And so then um, once it, it's called Flix Premiere, it's kind of like a Netflix for indie films and stuff. Once okay. it hit that, um, it's kind of lived there for a bit. But, um, you know, indie films, it's hard to get people to watch them. to watch those anyway. <laughs> you know, it's hard. No one knows you don't have a star in it or something like that. People aren't really seeking out those type of films typically. So for what it is, uh, it, it, it did well, but you know, that's in indie terms as, yeah, yeah. as well, which is I mean, you small had, number. You had fun doing it and, and enjoyed the process. Right. So, Oh yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. That's cool. No, I remember watching some of it. I didn't, I haven't seen the whole thing. I remember watching pieces of it. Gotcha. Yeah, because we got to do, I mean, we shot for 23 days over about three month period um, here and there. We had some lulls in it because there was different stories that we were telling. So we had to like get actor schedules and everything lined up and yeah, all that. So yeah. Um, yeah, 23 days of filming and six different cities. So it was, we had a lot of stuff going on with it. So it was a blast and, and yeah, get to do yeah. that whole process. Now, was that, did you personally finance that or was, did you have something going on behind, behind it? Um, found investors for that one. So I put okay. some of my money into it, especially with post-production. Once we were finding music and licensing gets expensive when you yeah, use yeah, real bands cool. and things like that. So, um, I put some of mine into it too, but we had, uh, an investor for, uh, for the most of it. Okay. Uh, you got anything else in the works? No, I mean, there's script ideas and things like that, that uh, I've kind of probably always script ideas. Though, yeah, right? you know, kind of rolling around and I just really need to sit and formulate more of it and, and do the actual writing so that can lead to the next project. But fortunately, there's enough going on with uh, the editing job now and, and the pickup jobs with acting and things that come about that, you know, at least I'm staying active in the industry, fortunately. So that's oh, that's good. cool. That's good yeah. to hear. Um uh, so with you being an editor and with all the, you know, your film experience, you got to be totally worse than I am when it comes to watching 
a TV, sh- well, especially a TV show. <laughs> you like tear them apart and be like, the dude, the dude in the last scene didn't have a necklace on. Now he's got a necklace on. I try not to, but I mean, certainly, especially with continuity and stuff. Yeah, I definitely it's stick it out. That's what I was looking for. Continuity. Yeah, but I mean, even with camera work and all of that, if something there's a shake in the camera or something is exposed in a weird way or things, yeah, a lot of those will stick out. I try to kind of, as I take notice of it, keep sticking to the plot and, and yeah, the acting and all that. I, I'd like to stay engrossed in it, but there's certainly things that'll pop you out sometimes and even sometimes just watching a commercial or something, you'll hear a piece of music that's royalty free music from some subscription oh, service yeah. that you yeah, yeah. used three times and now it's on a downy <laughs> commercial or something. Like, I know that piece. So yeah, as an editor, there's always little things that kinda pop out here and there. That that's happened to me. I heard some a uh, tune, you know, on a commercial. I'm like, wait a minute. I think- <laughs> I think that's the two. I heard that on a <laughs> royalty free when I was looking for music. Yeah, we've used that before. <laughs> um, is there a is there a TV show or movie that sticks out in the positive for production value for you? When you watch it, you're like, this this is just amazing. Oh I mean, yeah, yeah. There's tons not, of them, but I'm not talking like Marvel and you know I'm talking something that most people might not know that you know what i mean not not an indie film but like kind of a what sticks out for you there's two that come to mind kind of um they're certainly not small ones but they're not sometimes i'll talk to people about them or i'll have a shirt that one of them has i have a logo (laughs) for it and no one ever knows what the shirt is but um one is a show called the leftovers and that was three seasons on HBO. Okay. Um, wonderful show. Uh, really, really great production value, cinematography, music, just everything about that show was really great. And then there's one on Netflix, a limited series. I think it was 10 episodes um, called Maniac. Maniac. And that was one. Yeah, I had um, Jonah Hill and Emma Stone in it. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie F., the guy who did... Um, the first season of, oh my God, I just forgot the name of it. Matthew McConaughey, Time is a Flat Circle. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, the, the thing just fell out of my head. But anyway, um, yeah, Maniac just, and Leftovers are two really good examples of that that I would okay, cool. suggest checking out that kind of have just really great all around, fire on all cylinders for what production. Production value. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that... Ha- for a long time, nothing really stuck out with me. And then we started watching Yellowstone. Have you seen that? I haven't. It's on my list, and I know of it. Um, but, yeah, it's it's definitely one I want to see. Dude, uh, I just tell people every episode's like a movie because the first season or two, every episode's like a, an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 25 minutes. Yeah. And just the – you're just like they didn't – from day one because, you know – when you start watching a series, and especially if you come in, and I got a good example with uh, Game of Thrones, I st- I came in at the fourth season. So I started when it was four seasons in. I started in the first season, and I binged it over one weekend. Yeah. And, you know? And you can see that, especially, you know, at the time I was with GBH. So it's like, there's plywood. Why, why is there plywood? <laughs> and, and you can just see the the grittiness of it. Right. And then by the fourth season, you're like, this is like a super high end multi-million dollar production at this point. Oh yeah. They got all the money in the world at that point. Yeah. Right. Right. But the first season you were like, what what the hell is this? But if you didn't know any better, right. But anyway, not Yellowstone dude from day one, from the first episode, I was like, Holy man. I'm like, I got goosebumps now just thinking about it. It's, it's just crazy. Of course, the storyline is, it's a gangster movie. Most yeah. movies are gangster movies if you really look at them. But, um, but the production value, I was like, I got to tell Michael about this. Let's see if he has seen it or heard about it. But it's incredible, dude. And, of course, cool. it's shot up in the mountains, so everything, beautiful sunsets. And yeah, sunrise. I've seen some it's cinematography a, pieces from it, and it's, yeah, it's Yeah, so it's well crazy. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. And then um, my biggest pet peeve, with a TV show 
and maybe you can explain why this is. I think somebody tried to at one point. I forgot. Yeah. But you and I are talking in a, in a scene. Mm -hmm. the, ca the camera's on you, and it's looking over my shoulder, and you're talking. Okay? We see you talking. Yeah. And then the camera angle changes, and it's looking at me, but you're still talking. Mm-hmm. And your jaw's not jaw moving. Doesn't match up. I know where you're going exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that drives me fucking nuts, dude. Yeah, like, I hate so why, seeing that. Why is that? So is typically, it it's down to two things: it's either pace or it's performance. So sometimes, like my, I'll have my whole bit, and then you'll have your bit. But maybe I have three sentences, and then you have two sentences, and they're in the editing room, and it's really kind of lagging or they're on a thing where, okay, not so much more like it used to be with broadcast TV, but like our episode has to be 23 minutes. And yeah, so right. we've got to get all this fit in. So typically when they're doing that, it's to, uh, to keep the pace going and like hide a cut or something like that. So maybe they took out part of the sentence or they're combining sentences or, something is weird on my face or the expression and they want to see your expression instead, but they want to keep the words going, but they're doing something. They don't have that shot, any number of things like that, but it's typically uh. to do with pace. Um, or it could be, like I said, if they're, if they're cutting lines or they're, they're kind of trying to, maybe they're even using a different expression from a different part of the scene, but you're kind of, maybe I'm telling something that's a little alarming and your face is like, holy shit, man. And then later on, and there's a better version or a different take. And my ah, words were a little ah, different in that second take. Maybe I swapped a couple words, but they really like your expression. And they think, well, we're going to be looking at Walt's face, not so much at my lips at the very corner of the screen. Right, but right, if you're right. looking at it, you can see, oh, yeah, that's not in okay. sync at all. That's definitely see, off. That last scenario you said really makes sense to me to where they're mixing takes basically right so if there's four takes they like my expression here but they like his words here and then they don't when they mix that together they don't match up yeah oh, okay. i just did in fact a a a, a, sent a a exact situation like that i just edited a short film um that they did for a 48 hour film festival and there was it's a shot that uh uh a, a, a kid is in bed looking at the parent who's at the door and they're talking. And when they shot it, 48 hour films are shot very fast. Sure. And so, so wait, let me back, let me back you up. When you yeah. say 48 hour film festival, they have to shoot. So they come in with a script written, but they only have 48 hours to film it and edit it and write it. So what happens oh, is at 7 PM on Friday, you get a character name, uh, uh, a line of dialogue, and a prop. So it might say, Walt Blau is the character's name. He's a U-Haul, we'll say repair uh, mechanic at U-Haul instead. And then the line is like, holy cow, I never saw that coming. And then everybody gets a different genre. So team A will have a comedy. Team B will have a drama team C might have uh, uh, something with a, a femme fatale or things like that. There's all these different genres. Some are musicals. And so everybody has to incorporate those things into it. So at 7 p.m. on Friday, you get that. The writers spend Friday night writing it. And then Saturday morning, all the actors and director and camera show up. And then they have to quickly film and edit that um for the uh by 7 p.m on sunday it has to be turned oh, in exported 7 p.m on sunday now so how long is there a minimum that that needs to be in length yeah i think it's three minutes it's basically between three and seven minutes oh i was gonna say so you still have to do like, there's no fucking way they could do like a 20 minute skit that oh be, yeah yeah no because yeah, no, that'd be crazy yeah but it i mean it and it does need to kind of use those. So if you have no R and you've kind of maybe tried to write a script ahead of time and it's a Western or something and you can't really make it where, I mean, the, the fun of it is trying to make it within the parameters sure, that it sure. is. Um, but you know, you got to try to make it work, make sense um, rather than go something else and just have it as a throwaway line. In fact, they have 
awards for best use of prop and best use of line for people who've incorporated that best into their short film. Now, are there now if you you know you Michael Howard was like, I'm gonna go to this 48 hour film festival to write a script, mm -hmm. right? So you and I did. This is that's what I did on this most recent one was I wrote it. Oh, what which one? Uh, it's it's called Bind, but it was the 48 hour film festival that happened uh, this last fall. The one I was just gonna give the example of um, oh, that I ended yeah. up doing an edit for. Uh, I ended I up writing it? that one. Did I rudely interrupted you? Oh, no, no, no. That was a different <laughs> example. And it was boring anyway. So. Um, so if you go, so, okay. So you went specifically to be the writer mm -hmm. and maybe the director, right? Or, you know, a group of people. So you got, Hey, I'm going to write it, Michael, and you got to direct it. Yeah. But we have no idea what we're going to, you know, obviously what we're going to write, exactly. direct. but you don't have a cameraman or an editor. Now, are there people that go to these festivals that say, I'm just going to show up or put it through the circuit or through the, the community that I'm going to this 48 hour, um, film festival and I have a camera and I'll be happy to help. And whoever needs anything, call me. No, not so much that way because you sign up as a, you sign up as a team or as a group, or at least oh, one okay. person does. So like my friend, Chris Medico is the one who has spearheaded it for a number of years and I've done it with him in different uh, capacities, a whole bunch of years. And okay. so he will put together a team and he'll be like, I'm signing up for the 48 hour film project and who wants to be a part of it. And then whoever wants to, that are friends with them or have worked with them before in professional capacity, be like, I'd love to do it. I'll be an actor or I'm up for whatever I've got directing experience and acting and okay, okay. I can hold a boom mic or whatever. And then he'll kind of put people in these different positions, but there are, you can reach out to people like on Facebook community pages, there's film pages and things like that and say, Hey, I'm putting together a team. I need a cameraman and a sound person, anybody interested. And then you can reach out there and be like, Oh, I'd love to do it. And then right. they can join no, that way. Yeah. Now, kind of like a basketball tournament or whatever, you know, you have a team, right? Mm -hmm. Or like a, 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 a league. Okay, I have a team, but then there's a somebody that doesn't have a team that just says, throws their hand or throws their name in the bucket and says, hey, man, I can join any team. Are, are that, is that available like in the weekend? Does people just show up and be like, hey, Whoever needs some help, I'm here. I don't think so. Um, mm. I haven't signed up for one of them as like the leader of it. So I don't know if they have those type of things where there's a pool that maybe they share with the team leaders and say, hey, here's eight people here's who are happy team. to be a part of it. Call them if you want. But I know most of it is kind of prearranged that you have your teams and you know kind of who's going to be a part of it when you sign up. So um yeah, I yeah, think they just kind of have to look elsewhere or talk to people who maybe yeah, are in it. I would assume that you'd want four or five people with you that you're used to working with and mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of congeal with and can handle different things, right? Yeah, especially yeah. in this situation because it is so fast-paced and you don't have time to sit there and really argue over you know, how we're going to do camera or this or that. And having those shorthands and knowing those people really make a difference. Or if you know, okay, these right. actors they can nail it in one or two performances. We don't need to do 18 takes because they stutter their line a lot or they can't hit their mark or whatever. So, you know, right. you want to put together a good team of people that you trust and you like, and you can have a good time with, um, you know, all that. So, yeah. So how many, how many times during that weekend that you were up there for that 48 hour film festival, did you use my favorite line? We'll that's fix important. it in post. Fix it in post. Oh my God. <laughs> that happens. Well, that's that's one thing about the 48 hour, fortunately, is there is not a lot of time for post. So you can't put a whole lot on <laughs> post production because that might be Saturday afternoon to Sunday morning only or something like that. So um yeah, yeah, yeah. there's you gotta be careful with saying too much in post or you don't have your thing exported and then you don't have a film to turn in. So Yeah. What's <laughs> the is there like a prize pool or is that just a for bragging rights um there is in ways i don't know because you do get like certificates and awards and things and and we were fortunate to win 
a handful of them this year. And then uh, oh, we won the whole, cause they do it by city. And so this was for the Greensboro 48 hour film project, which is just now down the road. Um, but then they'll do like the Dallas 48 and the Miami or whatever cities there are. And when you win your city, there is a final competition of all the city winners that compete okay. and that's up in DC. And so we won, um, the best film for for this year for Greensboro. So we'll be competing sometime in the next few months or whatever up in DC with with other films and stuff. So there are things that can come from it. And um, I'm not sure about cash prize or whatever, but that goes to the people who run it and stuff typically. I, I think the exposure for you guys and the doors that open probably is what's worth it, right? The networking in, in part of it, right? Yeah, I think networking would be the most. I think sometimes it's just a fun project to do because yeah. it is so fast because what we did was so they had the film that was this year. Like I said, I wrote the film and then they filmed it and edited it and all of that. But we knew that there was going to be more than fit in the allotted time. So what they had me do afterwards was edit a longer version of it. That's not for the 48 hour film project. Oh, but it's nothing. the same film. So there's a longer version of it. And so instead of at seven minutes, now it's like 11 and a half. Okay. Um, so that version you can use and show people. I mean, you can show people any version, but the thing with 40 hour film projects is they are so fast paced that they're not always the best work you could do because maybe the camera is a little out of focus and you didn't have time to do another shot or performances weren't where you would typically want them, but you don't have time to keep doing takes. And so it's like, good enough. We got to go. We got what we needed. We don't have time for the extras, or maybe I would have liked a couple B roll shots, but we just didn't have time for it. Sure, and sure. so it's, I think it's more about the fun and the camaraderie yeah. of, of doing this and, you know, the excitement of making a film in, in two days and then <laughs> being able to say we did it, you know, and, and, yeah. and yeah, certainly there's networking. I've met people, that were brought into the group that, you know, like Chris worked with them, but I hadn't, but now we've worked together, had a good time and we'll work together again. So there's, there's certainly networking opportunities for it, but um, I don't, I don't feel for the most part, a lot of the films that come out of there are ones where people are really using those in a huge way of, um, Hey, here's what we've done, you know, short of it being part of the, the 48 hour banner and, and time right, to, right. It's kind of more of a hobby and get together and have a good time. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go, say, so when you go to Washington, D.C., right? It's Washington, D.C., right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, you'll meet, I assume you'll meet at whatever location, like it's being held in this part of the city, probably like Chinatown or something, right? I mean, there's got to be a district that it's held in, right? I mean, wherever, I mean, some conference center or theater or, or something, wherever they end up screening it, they'll, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't know much beyond that. Now, do you, so you come to this conference center, right? You all meet there and you get your, hey, it's this line and this character. Good luck. See you in two days. And you have like the run of the city and you just fucking fly around and figure it out. No, actually, it's um, it's not making another film. It's the film that we won at Greensboro. It's competing against the other okay. cities that so, won. So it's basically a film festival in D.C. of all these winning films now competing against each other. Okay, okay, but so when you made this film, so in Greensboro, yeah, you met at a conference somewhere at some point. Oh yeah, we just I mean it was just made in the city, so you just make it. And, like, and it's, it's centered out of Greensboro, but we were still our home base, so to speak, was still in the Raleigh area. But um, yeah, you just use whatever you can, <coughs> excuse me, whatever you can find. So if you need an apartment, you try to set those up ahead of time and say, all right, we're shooting in Bob's apartment. And that's yeah, where you yeah, go. Yeah. Film. Okay. And then you run around the, you know, I need a park and I need a empty staircase and you just find that shit, huh? Yeah. In fact, sometimes it's interesting because um, we uh, so there's a bunch of little cities around Raleigh, like Apex, Cary, et cetera, et cetera. In Apex, there was this little grocery store that was kind of a, a shit grocery store, just run down. Not real nice groceries, certainly not big like a Lowe's or whatever, just a little mom and pop grocery store. 
And so one year when we were doing it, you can't write your script or do anything ahead of time, but you can find places. So if you're like, all right, we don't know what we're going to be filming. So let's get a variety of stuff. Let's see okay. if we can that find, let's see if we can find an office space. Let's see if we can find a restaurant, this and that. So then if we get romance, let's write a restaurant scene, knowing we got a restaurant because that's going to give more production value than uh -huh. two people sitting at a dining room table. So okay. we did that. We found, a grocery store one year that let us shoot there. And so it was really cool production value of being in an actual grocery store and the guys checking out and beeping registers and all that junk. And so it was great. So the next year we were doing another film. And so we went back to that grocery store just to see like, Hey, we don't know if we're going to need to film here, but if we can, can we like, is it okay if we use this location? It was a new owner at that time, but what had happened in the interim of that year is, I don't know if you remember the movie Bad Grandpa with Johnny oh. Knoxville. Oh my God. So, yeah, so yeah. they filmed that, it was like a road trip movie, and they filmed in that grocery store. And you can actually see it, even if you go watch the trailer, there's like a scene where he's stuffing bread down his pants yeah, uh, to yeah. steal it, and he, the kid, he's pretending like it's his package and all that. Um, and so he's shoving the bread down his pants in this aisle and that's where we had filmed. And so when we went back to them, they had basically jackass money in their head. Well, it wasn't jackass, but the, the, the Hollywood studio money in their head oh, because shit. they got paid for that location. So then now they're thinking in their head, anyone who wants to film here, it's gotta be $20,000 or, you know, whatever they made. And yeah. so we're like, you're still this shitty little grocery <laughs> store. Just because they came, they needed a rundown grocery store. That's why they came here. But you're still this little <laughs> store. No one else is coming to film here. That was a fluke. Um, but they wouldn't let us film there. They're like, nope, this is what this is what we do now. It's going to be this amount of money. And so, of course, no one in their right mind is ever going to pay for it. I was just going to say, and they, never got, and they never got another film filmed in no, there and probably no, no way it, it, it like i said it was a fluke it's not even it's not even like wilmington like a film city of north carolina it's just this tiny little uh offset city uh near raleigh so um but yeah but like that as a location was an example of something you can look for but yeah, maybe yeah. you don't always get huh when uh when we were at gbh i would be looking for homes right because you know you need a living room or a yeah exactly you know, whatever room, and of course you go to a high end home because that's what you're looking for. And people were off their fucking rocker, dude. They're like, yeah, you can for twelve grand. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Would you just say? Well, yeah, you know. And then you have to pay this and sign this contract if you do any damage. And I'm like. I can understand that part of it. Where do, where did you get 12 grand from? Well, I talked to my producer friend over in LA. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Different. So you're, you're in bumfuck New Jersey and we're, you know, we need it for four hours and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not moving in a whole crew like they probably do like with that grocery store, you know, Hey, we're going to pay you this much. Cause that was probably, you know, the whole crew and the and uh, multiple vehicles out front carrying all the shit. You know what I mean? So they yeah, got to take it over. Production, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. So I ran into that a lot. And wow. even, uh, yeah, even with businesses, they're like, yeah, for five grand for this much for this. I'm like, no, nah, dude, right, pass, pass. Yeah. Yeah. Come I on. ran into that when I was doing scouting for uh, where we're meant to be because we needed a restaurant and very specific conditions in that restaurant that it had to be shot during the day but looked like it was nighttime and it had to look kind of nice and had to be closed on a sunday because we had to film the whole day and all of that so we were trying to find all these places and occasionally when we would go to somewhere and approach them about even the possibility of it they had huge numbers in their head yeah. of that and saying oh well a production has filmed here before we've heard about it uh yeah. and so yeah they just and for an indie film, when your budget is twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars or whatever, and they want twenty of that just for their restaurant, it's never going to work. So, and the thing is, I you know, and of course, I'll compensate you for the time and all that. I, obviously, I'm not saying give it to me for free, 
But come on, man, you gotta, you gotta, ha- you gotta yeah. get a little middle ground there. Be realistic of what's yeah. happening here and gonna yeah. happen. Yeah. The whole commercial's forty-five seconds, and I need twenty <laughs> seconds in your living room. Yeah, I need two people sitting on the couch laughing. It's like, give me a break. <laughs> We're gonna have hey. one camera on a tripod, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one sound guy holding a stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, th- I think that people get that, you know, that glaze over their eyes. Are like, oh, this will be my big, you know, I can make a big paycheck here. Yeah, um, now you're not getting anything. Exactly. Yeah, you could have made a thousand bucks, and now it's yeah. You yeah, could have made a thousand bucks in a fun store to tell your buddies when you're having beers in your barbecue. You know. Yeah, take it behind the scenes, throw it on your Facebook page or something. But yeah. no. Yeah, but anyway, um, all your stuff's on your website, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, for the most part, and there's links to things and all of that. So uh, it's definitely a good place to check out. Uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand, though. You didn't build that, right? You you had somebody build it for you? Yeah, there's a, a company called Tip Top Tech Solutions that did mine. And um, a guy named Wayne there um, who, yeah, built my site. And it, it was cool because he worked with me because I had my design in mind and everything. And so I knew what I wanted. I just, I don't know how to do those things <laughs> myself. So, um but yeah, it's uh, I I I'm really digging it. We just did a new redesign uh, about a year ago, and um, yeah. No, yeah. no, it looks and no, dude, it looks great. And uh, I was telling you about mine. I use Squarespace, and like you said, every podcast you listen to, you know, get ten percent off. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> But um, like, we'll be back with our sponsor, and then you hear a minute and a half of them talking about, oh, Squarespace is the best. They, I just, yeah, yeah. Oh. Not, I just no. tried it out, and I figured it out. Now, I, I got to tell you, man, I love it because my hillbilly ass could figure it out. Now, I'm telling you, the, the first time I made my site, it looked like a fifth grader did it. And I was like, I, I got to figure this out, man. I am not happy with it. And then I just sat down, man. I, I just kind of white knuckled it for a while and I got it about 80%. And I was like, there's still something just, you know. You know what I mean? You're looking at it and you're like, I like it, but there's just a little, I got to tweak it just a little bit. And I got a good buddy that works there and, um, I hired him for two hours and him and I jumped on there and he, and it was funny because we, you know, we were scheduled at like seven o'clock at night. Right. So we're on the phone and he's like, give me your password and stuff. And I give him my password. He's like, the hell you need me for dude. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, this site's amazing. He goes, I see sites all the time. He goes, you did all that? Who did this? I go, well, I did, dude. He goes, how'd you do this? I go, well, I figured it out. Dra- drag and drop, dude, you know? <laughs> and um, he showed me a few little tweaks and then a few things that I just couldn't, man, I couldn't figure out. And he's like, yeah, you just click here. Boom. And I was like, oh, you motherfucker. See? <laughs> and it's like the old, I just, um, what came to mind was that old joke or that old, scenario of you know on a submarine or something they couldn't figure out the how to fix it and all these guys were trying to figure out and they're like you gotta call this guy he come over and in like two minutes he's like fix that right there and that'll be ten thousand dollars and they're like you were here for like two minutes he's like it's not my two minutes here it's the 30 years of experience exactly, right yeah you know that scenario i knew what to do yeah yeah and that's exactly i'm like dude this is exactly why i hired you for two hours to help me out because i was been banging away at this thing for six hours and i'm still not figuring it out and he's like oh yeah you just click this little button i'm like oh. but yeah i um uh, the the uh customer support on squarespace is phenomenal dude they help they help even my crazy ass a lot. This um, segment brought to you by Squarespace. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say. And by the way, if you mentioned no, no, <laughs> it is this. This episode is not sponsored by Squarespace. But well, I did. I did, code. I did. I did enjoy doing it. Uh, you know, I'm like you, man. I I just like creating things as well. You know, it's just you get some satisfaction when you're building something and you see it come to alive and you're like i made that you know yeah and sometimes i'll have the vision for it i just don't know how to carry it out so it's surrounding yourself with people who can do that stuff 100 like, okay well i want it to look like this but i i can turn on the camera and i can focus it and they're like oh well i'll do this this and this and they're like there it is and so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. finding yeah. people who are good at what they do and yeah 
it's key. Yeah, and then, and even through this process with the with the show, and the, I call it a project, but with this project, you know, what we're looking at here, and this is all a process, you know, yeah. and just learning and asking people, and um, you know, I field test my my uh, episodes, right? So when I put out an episode, I'll listen to it in the truck the next day or the day after, you know, whatever I'm doing. So I get through an episode and how they on Spotify, it just goes to another random episode on your, on your platform. Right. Yeah, so it's like you're something. something else. Right. And it auto played my very first episode. <laughs> And I was like, holy shit. I was anyway. going to say, yeah, if you just go back and compare between now and then, it's it's always night and day once you get this far in the process and have learned so much. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. And then, like, I had a uh, my favorite author on, and I didn't, I didn't have my mic on. So it was the computer audio. Dude, it was fucking horrible. I'm like, and I didn't know it at the time because I'm talking in my mic and I can hear my headphones. Yeah, you know, I can hear it in my headphones, but it wasn't recording. Just shit like that. You're like, well, well eh, next, you know, yeah. that's the worst, especially when it's a one time thing. I mean, I did. Uh, I was filming uh, one of the newest employees at, at Storyboard. Uh, we were doing intro videos. And so I was filming her intro video and I didn't start the recorder for the audio. And so all the filming stuff was there and she went through and did it and everything. Uh, we did, I don't know, however many different takes and all of that. I'm like, cool, thanks. And I went back to edit it and uh, I realized I'm like, fuck, I never even turned on the audio. So I had to go back to her and she would be like, can we do that again? I'm so sorry. And fortunately, it was a quick, you know, 45 second thing. And um, it actually sure. worked out even better uh, once we went back in there and did it again. But if she was gone, like if that was a client that came in or we had a professional company we were working for and all of that and i did something yeah. oof, it's, that i was mean the, that's the best thing it could have been but holy oh, yeah. crap that gets you yeah i mean imagine me going back to that guy and being like hey man it didn't work out let's do it again <laughs> now he's gonna be like fuck you dude yeah sorry it didn't work out <laughs> yeah yeah but that's i mean that's the challenges right so now it's always before you know before i sent you the link i'm like checking audio and camera and you know you just gotta prep you know, yeah, and, triple check yeah, everything. I'm like, okay, yeah, that yeah. red light's still on. Okay, we're good. Yeah. If, you, <laughs> if you're watching the video, you can see it. But twice I was, I look behind me. I'm like, all right, red light's still on. I tried to, if you see over my what, right shoulder, you can see my little mixer, right? Yeah. I, uh, I was thinking about tipping it up enough at like a 45 degree angle so I can see the red light in my camera just for oh yeah well, for, no. for self-preservation that's smart <laughs> yeah yeah because i get because i get really i always get really worried about that even when filming like i said we do the three camera oh. for um this podcast and so i'm at the master camera and i'm sitting there monitoring audio and then the one of the close-up cameras is close enough to me and there's a monitor on it and i can see and that has a record button but then I have an SDI cable to the other camera and it doesn't tell me if it's recording. Oh. So I always know it's recording when I start, but I'm always just worried that the camera is going to shut off and I won't know it. And yeah, the yeah, visual's yeah. still there, but the recording's not. So it's always just one of those things where you just, you never know, man. But, and it's like technology, right? We always talked about it at GBH. It's not, it's not when, or it's not if it's when. Yeah. It's going to fuck up, dude. Mm -hmm. it, it, you're going to fuck it up one one time or another. But, you know, I think if, uh, I think it was Dan that was recording in that door. Do you remember that door creak? Oh, I remember, yeah. that. remember that? I remember that was like a huge deal because it was some client and you were trying to get rid of that. And I mean, it was a, it was like, ee! Yeah, and it was every take because they were going into the restaurant or the store or uh, the yeah, building yeah. and yeah, things like oh, that. Dude. That was that was so much fun. I had so much fun when we traveled and even even the local stuff we did. Yeah. Yeah, we worked our fucking ass off, dude. I tell people all the time I go it's a cliche but we were 7 days a week every all day every day just going like a yeah, but it made a difference because, 
like you and Ash and, and when we had Dan and, and things like that, it having the personalities makes yeah. a difference. So if I can get on G chat and make fun of you for a few minutes and then go back to something else and hear a joke or this or that, that I, the personalities make it so much better. And so, yeah, it was a blast, especially when you do like American detours and the traveling and all of that, yeah, um, that being cool. on location and everything just, yeah, had such a good time. Yeah, uh, dude, Ash and I would have so much fun talking shit to you and <laughs> in the camera, <laughs> knowing that you're going to be doing the post work. And one of the best, though, one of the absolute best. It, I think we were at a wedding, or at a or at a, a a bridal show. I think it was, and we put uh, pieces of paper in these picture frames, like "fuck you, Howard," and yeah. <laughs> you know. And we made like this awesome slider shot with it. And do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to save them all because then it'd be I'd be watching footage, and you guys would be filming like the dances or something like that. Right. And then suddenly Ash's face would come and she'd be like, fuck you. And then keep walking and things like that. So there's always something that was popping yeah, up. Yeah. Was shoots. Like, what, like one of those uh, uh, videos where it makes you like stare at it really close. And it's <laughs> and like, it pops up. Yeah, scary. yeah, pay attention, pay attention. Then some scary woman's face comes on. It was kind of like that. You're like paying attention, editing. All of a sudden it's like, ah! Yeah, Ash's face yeah. always scares me. So well, yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right, exactly. <laughs> But no, we were, man, that was just, it was fun. A lot of hard work. And like you said, everybody just, sure, there was times everybody wanted to kill each other, but majority of the time, we always had a good time. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's every situation in life, whether you spend you're that. at work or it's people you hang with or whatever. I mean, if you're not, you've, you've got to make the best of it, even if it's something stressful with work or this or that. you got yeah. to be able to joke through it. You've got to know when... You know, there's time to be professional and personable and all that, but you've got to be able to have that relationship, you know, with your coworkers and all that. And all the worst jobs I've had were ones where you just didn't like the people you worked with. And whether you like the job or not at that point didn't matter as much as it could be a shit job. And if you got the right people around you, it's so much better than, you know, just when you're with people well, you don't enjoy. When I, when I first met Val, you know, we were dating and, She'd bring up Maui, and I'd be like, "Fuck Maui," and she's like, "Maui's like this tropical paradise." I'm like, "Fuck that place," and it, you know, just who you're with, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I do. So there's something just popped in my head, and I got to ask your opinion on this because um, Ash and I, you know, because we would spend so much time together driving back and forth to shoots and all that, right? Yeah. We were in New York City one time, and we, uh, you know, a bus pulls up next to us, and it was advertising uh, the film school. What's the famous film school in New York City? Probably New York Film School. I don't know, but whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And basically, a couple hours because we were going to Old Montauk, Long Island, so you know how long that fucking takes. <laughs> but. Uh, our, our, we got talking about, and I'm throwing, I'm going to throw out numbers. I have no idea how much money it is to go to that film school. Okay. But say it's 50,000 a year. Now, would you rather spend the 50,000 a year and go to the film school for four years? So now you're at 200 grand, right? Or take the 50,000, live with three dudes in a, in a shitty apartment and take every production job that you could, even if it's some of them are for free or you're getting paid shit, right? Whatever it is to get that experience. And you do that for three or four years. Where do you think you like, how do you think one would balance to the other? I mean, there's pros and cons to both. I don't want to shit on the educational system of, of filmmaking because there's a lot to be learned, but I think now more than ever, uh, film education isn't so vital because there's so much out there for free and there's so many people who want to do it. And you're going to learn a ton, even on a shitty indie film that's shooting in your city and they're shooting in every city. Everyone's doing something. And so if you just go volunteer, in fact, that's how I met Ash. Not, her film wasn't shitty, but I met her by just saying, 
I want to work on film more. And I was, a, I started off as a, a volunteer lighting grip just to be on set and learn. Right. So you can right. do that with even shitty little indie films that are shooting for six, a six minute film or something like that right. and start making those connections and learning. And you can go on YouTube and there's just so much on there about how to do this, how to do that, that I feel it's, it's less important now than pre-internet and pre uh, Udemy classes and things like that, where <laughs> you didn't have that information readily available. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there's a lot to be had when you have classes and they teach you the fundamentals of film and then you get in groups and you're given a camera and so you can actually go use it properly. But my overall feeling is that getting out there and doing it is going to be, you're going to learn so much and it's going to be so valuable. So when we had that conversation, the internet and all that wasn't nowhere near what it is now. So I agree with yes. you there. Um, and speaking of, you know, going what you were just saying, fundamentals and, 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 uh, technical stuff nowadays, like you said, YouTube, and you could probably find some focus groups that'll show you even stuff that you would never even know. Yeah. Right. But I always thought, you know, trial or learn by fire is always the best way. And the example that I use is wedding cinematography. I don't think there's anybody that works as hard as a, as a wedding cinematographer. I'm going to, you just bust your ass, dude. Yeah. Right. And, and you're, you're in total chaos most of the day. Yep. Right. So if you're, if you can film and edit a, a really good, wedding uh, video, film, video, whatever you want to call it. Then you move into uh, uh, like a controlled environment. So I always thought that the film school was a controlled environment, but then you go and volunteer or work for basically nothing for a little shitty indie film. And you got, so, and you get to learn to work with different personalities and, and learn in real time, right? You know, don't, yeah. you don't coil it like this. You put it over here or you, you know, Hey, here's a little a life hack. You tape it up here and this, that, and that kind of shit you don't learn in film school, but then there's also value in film school. Right. But I mean, I would say you learn those things in the film school, but it's not the only place you can learn them. Yeah. I just thought that real world, you know, like you get a director that's a total asshole and is yelling at you the whole time. And then the next one is really super cool. Right. So you get yeah. to learn a different and you got sound guys that are jerks too and nice too. So, you know, you got that, but yeah, I just wanted your opinion. I got thinking about that because, uh, Ash and I talked about that quite a bit, you know, and, and, uh, we'd make little comments. Oh, you would shit. Do, I wonder if they teach you that in film school. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? There's certainly things you learn one place <laughs> over another, but I mean, right. there's a few examples I can give you of that. Well, one myself, I mean, before I took a film class, I made my first feature film. Now it wasn't a great film, but you did it. It was a film. You know, we yeah. had a script. We went and got locations and you know actors and all of that, and we learned a shitload. And that was the reason we made that was so that we could learn the filmmaking process, and then we could say, "Here's what we did with you know next to nothing." Now give us a little something to make something, and you kind of build from that. Sure. Um, and then bigger examples of it. And of course, these aren't nearly as common as it would be for most people. But uh, the South Park guys from Colorado, they were in film school and they ended up using their film school tuition and stuff to instead make Cannibal the Musical, which was a film that a feature film that they made that then led to South Park and doing all those things. And uh, one of the people that got me personally into filmmaking was Kevin Smith. And him and his friend, well, he was up in uh, a Vancouver film school and he had met somebody up there uh, that they decided, you know what, we can just go do this. And they, he dropped out before uh, the tuition was due so he could still get his refund and all of that. And then he went and made clerks. And so yeah, awesome. obviously that kickstarted his career. And so you don't necessarily always need that 
full education, the proper academic of it. And again, not to say that there's not worth in that because there's people right. who've gone through that, did it a certain way and very, uh, very successful. So it depends on the circumstances. It depends on who you are, the way you learn best. And if you can get on a set where you can learn stuff, cause you can go work on three indie films with people who don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're teaching you this and that. Um, uh, but if you yeah, get on proper sets where you are learning things, like you said, how to you know put up a, a an audio cable, things like that, um, that all has value. And the more you do those, and the more you make those connections, and then that person gets you on this film, and now suddenly you're a lighting grip, and then this and that, and you're working your way up, and then before you know it, you're a gaffer, and you've learned a bunch of stuff with real world experience. Um, as long as you can get in the right circumstances, which are also hard uh yeah. i think there's just a ton of value to that and so being on set and doing it is is humongous yeah and, and then uh the networking part of it like you touched on it as well you know you get to know people mm -hmm. and then you run into um you know you might run you never know who you're going to run into at that point you know you run into kevin smith you fi he figures all that out and then also not necessarily the you know, clerks, right? There's got to be some, like an athlete almost, there's got to be some natural talent that goes along with that. And school, a little bit of school, he figured out real quick that this is not helping me. I got this figured out and he moved on, right? Uh, good for him. But somebody might need a little more, uh, what, what, not the proper, but uh, formal education mm -hmm. to move on from that right like you said depending on how they learn yeah yeah because i mean i got a recording arts degree and so when i was doing that it was film it was tv production it was screenwriting it was media management with marketing and so it was like a little bit of everything to where i could see oh here's what i like and here's what i've learned and this mm -hmm. and that so i mean that was extremely helpful but that all came after i'd made a feature film and in making that film I learned a ton by doing things that just had to be done and also working with people who had some had done it some hadn't you know some of us hadn't done anything on film before but we wanted to and then the cinematographer we hired he was from california and he came out and did the film with us and so working with him i learned a lot about camera work and setups and things like that and then yeah. some of that was from like the cinematographer's handbook and the director's handbook and things like that, where they literally talk to you about like, well, when you have three people sitting, here's the angles, the 180 rule, all of those things. So there's ways to learn it that aren't necessarily academic. Uh, it just might, you might have to try some different things. So yeah, I think it, bo I think it boils down to how, you <laughs> how, how you learn best, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me to consume information, it's best this way auto audio or video combination right like an audio book uh like if i was to read the only books i physically read like hang on to is a bubblegum read you know like a belducci or a lee childs right yeah jack reacher series or something yeah if i if i was to read like uh a business book i just would not consume it would i'd get half a page in i'm like fuck all this but I'll listen, I'll listen to them, you know, when I'm driving, cause I drive a lot. So I, I listen to them and I, I tend to retain information more. So it all depends on how you, you know, you got to figure that out for your own self. Yeah. And like you said, when you, when you were having these conversations originally, a lot of YouTube videos and Udemy and things weren't a thing yet, but now, mm -hmm. I mean, with masterclass, there's podcasts, you can just find a podcast on screenwriting and they're literally hollywood writers who are doing these podcasts and you can learn yeah. so much from those things so if that's the way that you get information that works the best for you go download the shit out download all of those things oh, and yeah. and listen to them learn that way if you know yep. sitting in front of a teacher having that feedback having those opportunities works best for you go that okay. way you know so that's the nice thing now is there's so much there's there's so many options well the other thing too a big part of it, I believe, you just got to do it, man. Mm -hmm. You just got to roll your sleeves up and do it and, you know, fuck it up a couple times. You, you know, you're not going to be Bruce Lee right 
from your first yeah. session in martial arts. You know, you're going to get your ass kicked a bunch. And I just think that that's a good way to learn as well. Yeah, you know? and you're not getting hired on someone's film as director having never done it. You can direct your own. You can say, okay, I want to make this film. I'm going to do it. But if you're working for other people, you're doing small stuff anyway. So those are the times to fuck up. And you're like, oh, I didn't tape that down properly. And someone shows you how to do it. And you're like, okay, now I know. And then as that all builds. Well, so you're telling yeah. me if I went to film school for four years, they wouldn't call me to replace Steven Spielberg? Well, yeah, but you got to go to the film school for four years. $50,000 a year tuition. <laughs> I do. We're going to say, you fucking clown. We're going to shut this down, man. I yeah. appreciate you, man. Thanks. It's good catching up. Yeah, I knew, man. Always. I, uh, I knew that you'd be a good conversation about film and all that good shit. So I like uh, clicking on people about that. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to uh, be a part of it. What, uh, just holler at people where they can find you real quick. Um, yeah, I guess the best place is my website, invisibleproductions.biz. And on there, there's links to my work. There's links to social media, Wikipedia, all those different things. So you can find further ways to follow and all that. But that's probably the best place to start. And, uh, yeah, go down that rabbit hole. Awesome. And then how did you come up with my crayon broke for your Instagram? Um, that was just, it was something silly. Uh, there wasn't really too much behind it. I think part of it might've come inspired unknowingly from, uh, the old Simpsons, uh, where Ralph Wiggum is running around and he falls and then he goes, I broke my Wookiee or I bent my Wookiee. He's holding his little toy or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know. It just seemed like it, it seemed like a funny name and it stuck with, Gaming right. and social media and all of that. So yeah, I was just gonna say it makes kind a good of conversation cool. for people in gaming lobbies or various things. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, dude, we're gonna get out of here. Just hang tight. All right. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks again, bud. So the question is: Would you spend three dollars a month to watch Michael throw pudding at his chest? Let me know. Well, on the other hand, no, don't let me know. But let Michael know what your thoughts are on that. Best way to get a hold of him is everywhere you can links are in the show notes um also he would love to speak with you if you want to collaborate or have questions in the film and movie industry as you see he is extremely knowledgeable with uh not just schooling but experience so check him out he'd love to hear from you and i'm going to get you out of here because i know you got shit to do so don't forget live rishi Dot com use the code word table 50 and you're looking at 50 percent off everything at checkout in my website waltz kitchen uh check out all the podcasts i've been on that's the newly added page and also everything else around there and you want to reach out and say hello that'd be great so and remember when i say have a great day the motherfucker is silent till next time mm -hmm.